Great. Uh, yeah, so as mentioned, uh, I'm John and uh, this is Rusty and uh, we are both product designers in the New York office for this lovely organization. Um, and so yeah, we're here to talk today about, uh, talk to the product designers in the audience about how to uh, adapt what we know from designing other digital products for this new exciting space uh, uh, called VR. Um, and so, over the last uh, roughly, I guess about a year or so, we've um, we've been really digging into what VR is and what the the technology is like, and other experiences and the tool sets that are available to actually build these things. And then, I guess roughly over the last six months or so, we've uh, actually had some clients uh, have us concept some experiences for them, and. In particular, around the uh, consumer uh, brand space, right? Uh, consumer brand experience, uh, some uh, data visualizations uh, in VR, and then um, what's the third one I'm forgetting? Uh, oh, the, and then the 360 video, story, uh, 360 uh, storytelling, immersive storytelling. Um, oh, sorry, that was the slide I was supposed to show. There's my notes. All right, sorry, we're, get, we're getting used to this uh, little setup here. Um, so this talk is going to be about our uh, research and findings uh, over the, the last year or so. All right. Let's talk about airplanes and jetpacks. I know that's a bit of a random one, so <laughs> it's, it'll, it'll make sense in a moment. So uh, I think we can all agree airplanes have changed the world. Uh, this is like a little story I picked up recently from Ben Evans. Uh, so I remember, like, we all are aware, the Wright brothers, they made this uh, pretty crap airplane. They had it out in the field. They got it to go a couple of hundred meters. And then it was about five, six years later, we managed to cross the Atlantic. Uh, th there was this thing that they had going on where they'd created this fundamental technology. It was only really in need of this incremental improvement that was going to make it this life-changing thing for all of us. So they pretty much started off with this expensive toy, and then in like a pretty obvious path, they managed to turn it into a world-changing technology. And then meanwhile, we're looking at the jetpack, which really didn't get off the ground. Like jetpacks need a lot of fuel. You can cruise around in one for like 30 seconds or something like that. The problem being that the more fuel, the more you want to cruise around with your jetpack, which everyone wants, uh, the more fuel you need, the heavier you get, the more fuel you need. You have this problem where the, the, the technology is in need of this uh, leap of innovation. So I know this is random. I'm, I'm bringing it back now. <laughs> um, so at this point, we're seeing VR as the wooden airplane. It's the expensive toy. But we, have, we see on the horizon that there's no giant unknown leap that we're going to need to get this thing to be this world-changing technology. So yeah, so needless to say, we're, we're pretty bullish about it. Uh, it is, we feel like uh, as a medium, it is sort of on the verge of, of becoming uh, something uh, pretty great and something that uh, we think will be widely adopted. Um, and so let's talk about uh, where we are. Uh, where is VR now and where do we see it going? Um, before we do that, uh, let's sort of level set on what we're talking about uh, in, when we're talking about lots of things like, I think in our in description for our talk we talked, we mentioned like VR, AR, XR, MR, whatever. There's so many acronyms being thrown around around these technologies and back in the early 90s, Paul Milgram, who I think is currently a professor at the University of Toronto, uh, developed this um, reality virtuality continuum where on the left we have where we all are now, which in academia is referred to as reality prime. It sounds like something out of Star Trek. But, uh, and as you move to the further, to the, to the right end of the spectrum, you get into full virtuality, meaning uh, an experience that is completely mediated. Uh, everything you see is, um, uh, is, is uh, computer generated. And then along the way, you get into things where you know, augmented reality is slightly mediated and so forth. But um, what's interesting about this is that it, uh, it points to uh, one of the things that we think, as far as where AR and VR are going, uh, where eventually these two technologies will merge into one platform and the amount of immersion will just be a factor of, uh, of the experience that you're building. 
Uh, so where VR is today, uh, if you've used a, a Vive or an Oculus Rift and, or whatnot, uh, for the most part, it's very entertainment focused. Uh, most of the media available are games and entertainment and so forth. Uh, the cost is, as Rusty very accurately put here, ridiculous. Uh, you know, uh, to, to power a Vive or an Oculus Rift, you need a fairly expensive machine uh, beyond just your simple laptop. Uh, granted, there are somewhat cheaper options available now, like the, the Google Cardboard and so forth. Um, but the maturity of the platform, when, you say, when we're talking about, oh, sorry, I'm getting used to wearing this thing. When we're talking about maturity, uh, we're re referencing not just the headsets, but also the tools to build them, that the, the, uh, the tools you have at your disposal to create these experiences are also pretty new uh, and still a little rough around the edges. So as far as where it's going, as mentioned, uh, you know, eventually uh, these two technologies will merge into one. I, I think there's actually, I think I read about a couple of headsets on the horizon that are already starting to do this or, or, uh, or early versions of it. Um, and we think uh, maybe at some point it will become your go-to screen uh, or a one of your go-to uh, pieces of technology like the, the phone in your pocket. Um, the, the cost is starting to become a little more approachable. I think uh, you know, there are a few headsets coming out that are a little more accessible for people, uh, just from, at least even just from a cost perspective. And um, the maturity of the, the maturity is starting to get there. The, the tools that are coming out now are uh, a lot more accessible than they have been in the past. And we're, you know, we're hoping it will become amazing and friendly very soon, like all good products should be. Um, so, what is VR good for? If we're going to talk about the, the landscape of VR and, and where it is and where it's going, uh, why would we use it at all? Uh, and we sort of, in, in our sort of thinking around this, uh, we, we kicked this idea around a lot. And we arrived at what we think are the three main value propositions of VR. Um, one is that is that it captures focus. And we mean that beyond, sure, it obscures your vision, but focus is, goes deeper than that. Um, it, uh, th that it's, it's really great at uh, generating uh, opportunities for surprise, delight, and, and really deep focus. Um, it allows people to connect a lot deeper uh, with um, people, places, and ideas. Um, uh, Gob was going to speak in much more eloquently about this concept of empathy later on, but we think that's a really powerful thing about this technology. Uh, and additionally, it's a really great tool for uh, active engagement. Uh, we've seen lots of great examples of it being used in the education and training space. It provides uh, a really safe place to try new things um, and to accelerate learning. So with those uh, really awesome properties, what can you do with it? Uh, what client goals can you address? And this is just a smattering of things that we think are pretty cool, uh, pretty exciting. Um, it's, it's being used for new types of therapy, uh, like exposure therapies. Um, it's great for teaching and training. Uh, uh, NASA u has used it to train astronauts. Uh, we've seen examples of it being used to train people how to weld, uh, which is obviously a, a dangerous uh, prospect to do in, in the real world. Um, it's great for engendering empathy and understanding. Uh, it's, uh, I think the Ford Motor Company uses it uh, in their R&D uh, of uh, new car concepts. So it's great for lowering R&D costs while uh, increasing quality. Uh, and uh, it's great for increasing customer loyalty. Uh, some of the brand experiences that we've seen out there are, are, uh, tell, are really good at, at bringing people close to uh, uh, the, uh, the brand's story. Can I grab the clicker? Yeah. Thanks, pal. All right, so building worlds, not screens. That's basically what we're talking about. I think there's, uh, we're talking about product designers who are perhaps Water. pretty established on the screen and trying to find their way into this like world building uh, side of things. I mean, uh, from here on, we're going to try and break it down by what's going to adapt, what's going to change for us, and what we should be leaving behind. So I, I love this quote. It's, uh, in times like these, it helps to recall that there have always been times like these, which uh, it can, you know, uh, Things might seem really crazy, unestablished, unfamiliar, but uh, we've been here before. We've, uh, we've dealt with it. Uh, designers have found their way through it with some pretty mixed results. So, yeah. <laughs> Very mixed results. <laughs> we remember this, right? <laughs> so was a, there was a back at that sort of turn of us getting the internet and having our dial-up uh, modem, we were sh there was a lot of the designers were shoe-horning uh, shoe old techniques into the new technology. So we've got this um, 
exploration of using RGB for publishing when we'll perhaps use to the print colors and uh, trying to really cram what we're doing in newsprint into the browser, getting that, you've got to get it all above the fold. So it was, a, you know, it was an ugly time, but in the time uh, since then, I think we've seen the web become quite a beautiful thing, and uh, we've all come to sort of rely on it all the time, and there's norms that are built into it. And uh, on that, uh, well, actually, I'll jump to the next slide. Like it, along with things looking a lot more beautiful, we've developed much stronger processes for getting to those, uh, the right outcome. So from here in, we're going to break it down a little bit by how product designers might already be looking at how they produce their things. They've got their processes. They've got the act of actually designing and the tool set that they're uh, working with. So I'm just going to kick off with processes here. And uh, again, uh, what adapts, what changes, what stays behind? For the most part, when it's coming to some of the uh, processes that we all might be familiar with, we've got design thinking, we might be thinking about making agile software, we're talking about keeping it lean. All of this is translating over beautifully. It's adapting. It's, uh, and I think this really covers it really n nicely, the idea that all of these are, aren't based on very uh, prescriptive models of how to build the thing. They're more about decoupling these uh, focuses on quality, usefulness, flexibility in process, uh, being user-centered, and seeking insight and feedback information, doing user testing. Again, this is probably looking pretty familiar. Maybe you've all uh, put this slide in a deck before, or someone's presented a slide similar to this, that nice agile style of like asking those good, tough questions, getting started with low fidelity as soon as possible, and prototyping as, as quickly as you can. In this case, we're talking about putting it on a headset. It's uh, pre pretty pivotal, in, especially in VR, that uh, that when you really do want to get the thing into the headsets uh, that we were talking about, when you're prototyping, you're going to be doing what would be the equivalent to wireframing or gray boxing, where you might be just throwing down some squares, you're putting up some walls, perhaps a table or something like that. You put the headset on, and all of a sudden, you have a table that comes up to your shoulder. Perhaps there's some glasses that you're supposed to put on, but they're clown-sized, and they're going to throw one over each shoulder, or they're very, what would usually fit the human face is actually quite a spiky thing to look at with the arms pointing directly at your face in the, the VR headset. So the sooner you're getting to that, into that testing and trying it out, the sooner you're iterating and evolving this into something that's going to be great. I mean, this is pretty obvious, isn't it? But like, what stays behind is bad process. Unfortunately, when we're designing for perhaps web or apps, there's all these um, established norms and interface patterns that it doesn't feel good to say it, but sometimes a bit of bad process and being able to throw a design across to a developer and not having this beautiful iteration is you're going to get by. It might end up being a little bit mediocre, but it's going to be usable. There's going to be some shared understanding of how to make something great. I just don't think that's going to be happening for anyone in VR. You're not going to be able to create this beautiful world, these beautiful interaction patterns and functionality, and hope that you're able to dump that off and then walk into it and, and feel like you're content with the, the outcome. Yeah, so uh, let's talk about some of the nuts and bolts of designing the experience. Um, one of the tricky things about designing for this stuff, especially for us uh, coming from the mobile and web world, uh, is that uh, the, the creative language around VR, um, as, as was already mentioned, uh, is still being written. We, we don't have a, a codified set of uh, terminology or, or thoughts around um, how to even talk about these experiences. Um, and this is not unlike, as Russ mentioned about uh, the early days of web design, uh, uh, VR is in a similar place as the early days of film, where it's this, it's this brand new medium that we don't quite know how to talk about, and all of the rules are sort of being created as we go along. Um, so we need a new creative language, or we need to adjust our creative language. 
So let's take it back to the beginning and, and talk about uh, the differences between what we have been designing and what we will do, uh, what we'll design. And obviously screens and worlds are, are very different geometries. Your screen is flat and has uh, a very defined edge. And this is true whether you're talking about uh, watching uh, something on your television, on your phone, on your, on your computer, uh, whereas a world is edgeless and is all enveloping. Uh, and so we're really familiar uh, with working in 2D space as product designers. Uh, we've all been trained in the basics of 2D principles uh, such as scale, color, proximity, stack order, contrast, relationships to the screen edge. These are all the tools that we use that we manipulate to tell stories and, uh, and guide users through information spaces on a flat surface. And these are still useful. I, I don't want to say that we're tossing all these out and here's a whole new set, but we need to adapt them a little bit. And, it's in, and we uh, potentially run uh, a danger of creating bad VR by wholesale just dropping these into an immersive environment. So one of the things about, these, the, uh, about the small screen is that uh, it's essentially a little window into an information space. Um, and uh, these, um, uh, and we borrow these principles, of course, from um, uh, established established uh, principles in print media. So, what's new? Uh, new principles that we uh, need to learn, like people like Rusty and I, uh, are 3D spatial principles. Um, if you've done, uh, for those in the room that have done any sort of 3D modeling or 3D animation, these are uh, probably pretty familiar to you. Uh, if you're like us, uh, uh, product designers, these are very new things, and so. Uh, these principles are things like uh, horizon, uh, sky, ground, uh, depth and distance, perspective, where the user is looking uh, in that space, light, peripheral vision. These are things we've not had to deal with before. Um, and what's interesting about them is that these are the uh, uh, spatial principles that we use to orient and anchor ourselves in our real, in our real lives. And so what's interesting about VR is that people expect those things to work the same when they enter this new space. Uh, the, and the, the closer you can map those to what they expect in their physical lives, the more comfortable, the more familiar um, the interface, uh, whatever interface you, uh, you create in VR will be. Um, what's particularly interesting is also that um, research in uh, the cognitive sciences um, shows us, uh, or it's a theory, but shows us that uh, the, even the way that we think, even the, uh, our thought processes are driven heavily by the, our bodies and our embodiment. So even metaphors that we use for complex things are rooted in physical actions, uh, you know, such as I hit the wall or uh, I fell hard for her or something like that. There, we describe these complex emotional things in physical terms. So what are... Um, what are some of the other new things that we, we might need to consider? And uh, this was touched on uh, again in, our, in the previous talk, but um, uh, in addition to those 3D spatial principles, uh, you have a whole slew of new ways that you can guide a user through the experience. And audio is a, is a huge one that is very new uh, to most product designers. Um, their audio cues are extremely useful for um, uh, 3D, uh, I should say stereo audio cues are very useful for helping us orient within a space. Uh, also, uh, action in, uh, in peripheral vision is a great way uh, to get attention and direct the gaze. Uh, and the reason these things are important also is because uh, as uh, product designers on screens, we're really used to knowing exactly what a user is doing. They're just sitting there looking at your screen. They're not, you know, you, you don't care what else they're doing with their hands or whatever, but you know that they're viewing the thing from a fixed distance and you know where they are. Um, whereas in VR, you have no idea. When they put the headset on, you don't know what direction they're necessarily facing. Uh, you can't necessarily predict where they're going to look first or second. Uh, you can guide it, certainly, but um, the, the direction of the gaze is something that you have to learn to uh, work with and, and manipulate, if necessary. So, what happens if we don't do this? What happens if we just ignore all these 3D spatial principles and, uh, and creating things that are uh, familiar to, uh, to our, um, our experience in, in, uh, in the physical world? Uh, if we just map uh, what we know in flat UI uh, directly into VR, your users uh, will have a very bad time. Uh, you'll be creating interfaces that are unfamiliar and disorienting. Um, this is a bit of a heavy metaphor to use for it, but I think you get the idea. So, 
what are some examples of VR that we think are doing a, uh, have done a really great job uh, with natural UI um, in the experience? And if you're unfamiliar with it, this is uh, from, and we didn't create this, by the way. I wish I could say we did. But uh, it's a really great experience called Everest VR. Uh, I believe it was by Solfar, right? Yeah. Correct. Um, and so what, it, what this experience aims to do is to, uh, to uh, give you the experience of uh, being a mountaineer on Everest. Um, and you know, rather than walking up to the ladder and having a floating button that you swipe that says climb ladder, you literally take your hands and pull up the ladder. It's what you would expect in, 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 uh, in the natural world. Um, where they do include uh, 2D UI elements, they do so in a, in, a, in a pretty smart way in that these elements are anchored in the space uh, very similar to environmental signage and wayfinding. So uh, for the designers in the room that are familiar with environmental graphics, this should look really familiar. And you can bring that experience directly into uh, developing things like this. And what we love about this is that you know, these things are anchored in reality and they have weight and, and thickness. They aren't just floating panels uh, in front of your eyes. Uh, another great example is uh, Tilt Brush. Uh, if you've, uh, this is probably one that a lot of people have demoed uh, in, in uh, the first few times you put on a headset. Uh, and the thing in particular that we like is, is how they handle the palette, uh, the painter's palette in Tilt Brush. Uh, uh, most artists are familiar with holding things in the offhand that contain my paints, and so it's not completely unnatural to have these, even though the, the UI, the, we take some issue with, with the, the 2D UI on some of those panels, the fact that they anchored it to the hand feels very natural and, and, it, and it's, uh, it's easy to pick up and adapt to uh, really quickly. Cool. Thanks, Val. So I'm going to run this through uh, a little case study of some work that we've been doing, some uh, concepting uh, based in uh, the retail of sunglasses. So we've, uh, we were approached in a situation where it was like, we want to present our products, and we, we feel that we wanted to look and resemble our store, which immediately it sort of sets off a few things where you like that that physical world just isn't going to translate you don't get to just port the thing over and uh, cram it in and, and everyone goes in and gets to pick up and try on sunglasses and whatnot so we came back with some uh, some concepts that we tried to shape an experience that was uh, more more friendly and intuitive within the constraints of having uh, two controllers and, and a headset on. I mean, one, some of the setup and thoughts about this user journey is that they're going to walk into maybe a store or a kiosk. They've probably got a few minutes where they want to try on a headset and have this little sort of special VR moment and then go away and have their retail uh, experience happen in the physical world after that. So it's brief. There's, a lot of, there's potential for a lot of friction here with trying to onboard people to mechanics for travel or locomotion, uh, picking up things and interacting with them, and we've tried to dodge that. So to start off, there's actually your bust will be presented to you in VR, which is, uh, it felt a little unnatural and concerns about uh, Uncanny Valley, but we went out, we got a scanner, we decided started doing some 360 scans and putting some glasses on and having a look at them, and it turns out it's actually quite interesting to look at yourself in the third person. It's actually what you're, that struggle you have when you walk into a sunglass store and you're posing in these ways that you're trying to hit on yourself and uh, sell yourself a pair of sunglasses, basically. And uh, so we've got this model where you're, it's a somewhat your uh, distance from it. So you come in, you fill in your email and a few forms, and you get your scan, and then we put you into the headset, into the actual VR experience. So when we get into this experience, we've set up this stage. It's in quite a dark room. It's lit. It's got these two tiers which rise up and come up to you. So there's immediately this limitation on where you should move, for, move to. There's a comfort where it's quite approachable where you are. It dips down lower and is out of the way. So you know you're standing in the right place. You're front and center. And then the glasses aren't on racks. We don't, we're, we're fortunate to not be limited by physics. Which, and so we've got these floating sunglasses, and rather than having any sort of tough interactions, simply by gesturing left and right, you're able to wave the uh, glasses by and uh, wait until you see a product that you're interested in. So when we've, on the front of the panel, we've got this area where the glass that arrives there is 
presented on the, the bust in front of you. And then on the top tier of the stage, we've got these just big, reasonably large uh, balls that have different options. By swiping your hand through these, you can change the colors, or you can add the products to your bag. So uh, originally where you're filling in your email address, uh, by swiping through, it gets added to a bag. And we're trying to offload those complex interactions that have anything to do with uh, like online retail or digital retail. No one's about to pull out their credit card, try and input their details and their mailing address or anything in VR. So it's purely uh, glancing and uh, browsing experience. Uh, so the second concept that we came into this with was trying to get away from this looking at physical products when we're already in a physical product space where we can look at what's being produced and what's available in the store. So we called this the destinations. Uh, so we're trying to make an aspirational brand experience. Um, so we're trying to, and uh, you know, we've got these like glasses are a fashion item. People are picking them for certain purposes. And most sunglasses have a perfect setting which people aspire to be living in. So we have these glasses. You can see on the lens that there's a little bit of a scenery there. And we've, uh, the concept is that by trying on a pair of sunglasses, you go to the perfect location. As the gl glasses approach your face, the view overtakes as you would expect the lens does. But on the other side of your vision is this tropical set up. So you arrive, there's tropical music, there's a voiceover that's telling you about the products and uh, it's bringing you out details about the glare reduction and tinting. So we're trying to take people on this little journey where they're seeing where perhaps in this case their ski goggles are going to help them with their performance and protection and glare and improving visibility as well. So it's coming in, seeing your product, and getting taken away on this somewhat sort of psychedelic journey, and then afterwards being able to purchase the physical products. So I think we've been talking a lot about the conceptual side of things a little bit here, and let's get into the concrete of what are the tools and what is the hardware that you're going to be using to start making some VR if you're currently designing digital products and, and VRs tickled your fancy. Hopefully everything across to the left side here is looking pretty familiar. So the software that we're all using, we've perhaps got uh, some vector-based layout software, something that we're able to make responsive designs or multi-device designs. We've got Photoshop where we can push around some pixels, improve our picture quality. And then we're trying to take it through. We've got Framer there where we're prototyping. The end-to-end the -end, uh, is just so mature and established. It's, it's such a <laughs> safe, nice place to be working. And of course, we're all sitting at a MacBook. Maybe you've got a few other little bits and pieces around, but that's a, a pretty reliable setup. Uh, and for the platforms that we're outputting the work we're doing, web and desktop, and then of course, mobile. When we get into VR design, unfortunately, in the case of uh, software adapting, it's, it's, you're going to find yourself hitting a ceiling pretty quick in the piece. Like I've, I really avoided wanting to get into the too much 3D stuff too early. Like How can I avoid this and just stick to my sketch and like lay out some interface that I'm going to put on the surface of squares, which is, uh, like I mentioned, you you're hit a ceiling pretty quick, and you're, you find yourself making things that are underwhelming and not reaching that promise that you've been offered by this hardware. So across to the right here, I've tried to outline just a couple of basic things. It's, if you're already rocking the MacBook, you're going to be able to get a game engine that's going to run on there. We've got uh, like making organic forms and being able to sketch and whatnot is available. There's free options to do all of your modeling and animating in there, and as well as a few paid options. And then just making those beautiful textures that are just uh, like a treat to work with. And there's such special tools here that you, you're, it'll make you a little unhappy to go back to designing where you're just picking hex codes and whatnot. So yeah, I'm trying to find, I tried to find my way that I'm working still on my MacBook. I didn't need to get a massive server that I'm trying to run and uh, run, render out all these things at my house. And of course, that's still just going to be a factor. If you want to be running a Vive or an Oculus, you do need to have that uh, big beast that's able to support the, the requirements there. But of course, we've got mobile VR, and you probably have half of the equipment you need for that in your pocket at the moment. Yeah, so um, it, some additional tools, and we'll, I'm going to fly through these 
uh, pretty quick uh, since we're, we're getting a little short on time. But uh, you can go uh, look these up on, on your own uh, if you're interested. But uh, some of the tools we're going to show now are some of, the, some of those that you can use for, uh, to get you uh, started really quickly with prototyping. Uh, some of the tools that uh, Russ uh, mentioned are um, uh, some fairly high power tools that you can actually use to create some really production quality uh, VR. Um, but if you want to dip your toe in and really quickly prototype an idea without committing to um, uh, really specialized tools, you have some great options for that. Uh, one of them, of course, if, uh, if you're a product designer and you have used Framer, uh, or Framer.js, you're in luck. Uh, there is a VR component you can use in Framer uh, and that allows you to get uh, a very basic VR experience into a Google hard, uh, Cardboard headset really quickly. Um, it's fairly simple. The, um, the level of interactivity is pretty low. It just builds basically a cube map that you drop a user inside of and you can populate with objects and see it in a, headset, in a Google Cardboard headset pretty fast. Um, a better one is A-Frame. Uh, if you have some HTML chops, you can use the A-Frame uh, framework. Uh, it uh, provides you a set of new HTML components that define 3D objects. And if you, uh, when you're done creating your, and this is a, an example of what it looks like, when you're done with your markup, you can throw it on a web server and see it in a headset in minutes. It's, uh, it's very fast. Um, what's cool about A-Frame, though, is that although it is just markup, it actually will, uh, it does support uh, the Vive, Rift, it will use the baton controllers, it's, it's remarkably sophisticated. Uh, now, if you don't want to mess with code at all, if that kind of freaks you out, uh, there are some other tools available to you. Um, the uh, Unreal Engine 4 has uh, this tool called Blueprint, which is basically, as you see here, it's a visual scripting tool. Um, as Russ mentioned, though, you do, uh, mentioned to me, uh, that you do have to create your 3D models first, and then this allows you to hook them up with some uh, uh, basic logic for turning things on and off and, and that sort of thing. Uh, another great tool that just came out recently, uh, a, a design studio was lamenting that they couldn't just go into VR and prototype directly inside of uh, the platform, so they created this tool themselves and just released it uh, for free. Uh, you can go download this now. It'll work with the Vive. It's called Storyboard VR, and it's basically you go into VR and you start sketching inside of VR. It allows you to drop objects in and connect them together and create animations all within uh, the headset. Uh, the one thing, the one note about this is that it is not a production quality. It doesn't produce like production-ready VR. It's really for just prototyping the ideas and proving out uh, your hypotheses. And uh, I'll skip this one real quick. We're running out of time, but uh, this is one that uh, another in VR uh, uh, editor called Unity Editor VR. Cool. So I just I just wanted to sort of close on the fact that uh, perhaps for any designers here that were thinking about VR and it's quite an intimidating thought, perhaps it's a pretty foreign idea for you to be getting into 3D. I was in a similar place quite a while back when I was. I just wanted to fill my Dribble account up with some like animated GIFs of polygons and like sexy models and 3D models. And um, since then, I've uh, been playing around and like w did a lot of just tinkering and getting into perhaps Blender and stuff. I I went to work one day on a weekend and just was like, I'm going to put this day aside. I'm going to try and get some of my models into VR and I'm going to try and have a look at how this works. About 20 minutes later, I was done. Like it was it's. There's squares here that I did some drawing on. I put them in there. There's some like basic integration of some tools that are openly available. You can find a 10-minute YouTube video. Within moments, you can find yourself standing next to a JPEG that you produce that's 10 feet tall and looming over you, and, uh, and you're able to manipulate it super easy within there. So I just hope that if I can pass something on today, it's that. There, if you feel that you're going to hit a ceiling or you're going to hit a point that you're going to need a developer to do all of that work for you or some other professional, there's, uh, there's definitely a pretty uh, low friction path to getting started and getting something uh, in a 3D world. So that said, you got this. Go forth. Dip your toe in. It's great fun. Thank you.